Sabbe satta bhavantu sukitatta bhavantu sukitatta Hello. So today we're going to talk about apophatic paraphraxis. <laughs> Why do I like these big words, you might say? Well, I don't, actually. If I could explain all this stuff in words of one syllable, I would prefer to do that. It just so happens that these words say exactly what needs to be said to understand the Buddha's teaching. And because people don't know these terms and don't understand the concepts behind them, they also miss the actual significance of the Buddha's teaching. Therefore, they're unable to attain enlightenment. So to avoid this tragedy, we have to introduce these technical terms that explain exactly what the Buddha is talking about. So first of all, apophysis. Apophysis means talking about a subject, around the subject. The subject itself remains tacit or unspoken. That's apophysis. And paraphraxis refers to circumlocution talking around something without actually mentioning the thing itself, indirection, in other words, talking about something else to describe the actual subject, or euphemism. A euphemism is an expression that uh, explains something difficult or uh, uh, something we don't want to speak about directly, and so we use a euphemism. A good example of apophysis is the kite essay that we used in the other video. I'll put it up here on the screen just for a second. You remember this. It makes sense grammatically, but not conceptually, until we add the title kite. That's apophysis. And an example of paraphraxis would be a woman complaining that I don't have a single thing to wear when she's in the middle of a closet full of clothes. And what she's really talking about is, everything I have makes me look fat. <laughs> well, maybe she is, I don't know. But anyway, she doesn't want to say that, so she says, I don't have a thing to wear. And we run into this all the time in life, and especially in the Buddha's teaching. Why? Well, before we get to that... <laughs> Another example of both apophysis and paraphraxis is this series, this teaching, these videos. Uh, if you haven't watched our previous videos series, especially the Matrix Learning and Apophatic Antifragility series, you're going to have a hard time understanding this series. And the reason for that is that we treat that material as apophatic. In other words, we assume that you already know it and are familiar with it, have mastered it, actually, and now you're ready to see how it applies in the Buddhist teaching. So if you haven't already watched our previous series, you really should go back and take a look at them. Otherwise, you're not going to understand what we're talking about because we don't have time to explain everything in one video. <laughs> the video would be 100 hours long. So... Similarly, the discussions in the Buddha's teaching, in the suttas, will not make much sense unless you understand the actual subject matter is Nibbana. Nibbana is the aim, the core, the essence, uh, the subject, actually, of the Buddha's teaching. But the Buddha doesn't mention it in every sentence. He doesn't mention emptiness. He doesn't mention... Uh, dependent origination or paticca samuppada in every single paragraph. Yet, these things are there lurking in the background. And if you're not familiar with them, you'll have a hard time putting the Buddha's teaching in context. So the Buddha uses apophysis. He uses paraphraxis all the time in his teaching. And without an understanding of these semantic devices, uh, these ontological strategies, it will be very difficult to understand how the teaching works and how to implement it. 
So Nibbana is apophatic in the suttas. Nibbana is given in the suttas as an axiomatic, undefined, and indeed an indefinable term. And the whole of the Buddha's teaching revolves around it. So Nibbana transcends everything, including being, non-being, conceptual thinking, language, even consciousness. So it's very difficult to talk directly about Nibbana. Therefore, the Buddha talks around it. He treats it apophatically. Starting to make sense now? The Buddha's teaching is, is, is both uh, apophatic and periphrastic in that he uh, treats Nibbana without defining it by the use of epithets and euphemism. For example, he uses the term the end, the goal, the rock, the island, the far shore, extinction, cessation, all as synonyms for Nibbana, without saying Nibbana directly, because Nibbana cannot be spoken about directly. It can only be spoken about indirectly, especially in terms of what it is not. So this is the actual mood of the Buddha when he's giving his teaching, that he's talking about Nibbana without mentioning Nibbana. This is periphraxis. Now, why is this important? Because keeping Nibbana undefined gives the Buddha's teaching immense anti-fragility. And if you haven't understood what anti-fragility is, go back and look at our series, Apophatic Anti-Fragility, and then you'll understand, or you'll understand more. Anti-fragility means, well, it's different from robustness or strength or even uh, the ability to self-heal. Uh, rather, it is a type of strength that increases from unexpected events. Most of our current systems and structures sustain some damage when unexpected events occur. And then we have to rebuild or repair or amend our structures to take account of these happenings, unpredictable, unforeseen happenings. But the Buddha's teaching isn't like that in its original form. The Buddha's teaching is infinitely adaptable. And in fact, the more surprising, the more novel, the more unexpected, the things we encounter in the Buddha's teaching, the more strong it becomes. So this is anti-fragility. And the anti-fragility of the Buddha's teaching is exactly due to the fact that it's apophatic and that Nibbana is undefined, indefinable, unknown, or even unknowable. Now we're talking about Papancha. A papancha is also apophatic and or periphrastic. It's hardly ever about what it seems to be about on the surface. Just like the essay about the kite. It appears to be about this and that and the other thing. But it's actually only about kites. And you wouldn't know that unless you know the subject or the title. So papancha is like that. It's a series of statements that appear to make sense independently, but actually they have a different meaning once they're in relation to the original subject. Uh, Heidegger talks about this in his books on existentialism, and he talks about it as idle talk. In other words, it's talk that has no practical application, no referent back to an actual thing. The conversation has become detached from its subject. And this is apophysis, <laughs> okay? So idle talk or papancha, the proliferation of conceptual terminology, is more or less disconnected from its source, its actual meaning, or the reality that it's supposed to represent. This happens especially as a function of verbal forms, grammatical forms. For example, verbs are said to conjugate, which reminds us of biological proliferation, uh, conjugal, uh, from roots, verbal roots, into a variety of tenses. 
past, future, present, progressive, and numbers, singular, plural, and persons, the subject, the object, the indirect object, the causal object, and so on, depending on the complexity of the grammatical functions of the particular language. And nouns decline from the nominative or subjective to the accusative or objective, and they may have a bunch of other forms such as gerundive and uh, possessive and so on and so forth. And these are called different cases of the noun. So papancha is already there in the structure of language. And as soon as we take any noun or verb, we can use the rules of grammar to generate unlimited more forms and combinations of forms just by grammatical rules. Whether or not they make any sense in terms of the actual subject is a different story. So it's easy to talk nonsense without any referral back to the original subject, which by this time has become obscured and forgotten by the words themselves. So let me read some quotes from Concept and Reality. The expansion or diffusion of thought as envisaged by Papancha tends to obscure the true state of affairs inasmuch as it is an unwarranted deviation giving rise to obsession. This particular nuance in the meaning of the term becomes obvious when papancha is used to denote verbosity or circumlocution, paraphraxis in other words. In fact, it is probably this latter sense found in common usage that has assumed a philosophical dimension with its transference from the verbal to the mental sphere. In other words, the same phenomenon that we know in ordinary speech as run-on language, huh? the drivel of uh, trivial statements about nothing in particular, uh, idle talk, transferred from verbal to the mental realm becomes papancha, and especially papancha sanyasanka. This uh, tornado, this whirlpool, this uh, centripetal force, a network of meanings, all circling around nothing, <laughs> because the original meaning has been lost. Like the legendary resurrected tiger, which devoured the magician who restored it to life out of its skeletal bones, the concepts and linguistic conventions overwhelm the worldling who evolved them. At the final and crucial stage of sense perception, fasa or contact, the concepts are, as it were, invested with an objective character. This phenomenon is brought about mainly by certain peculiarities inherent in the linguistic medium. As a symbolical medium, language has an essential public quality about it. This public quality has necessitated the standardization of the symbols, words, as well as of the patterns of their arrangement, grammar and logic, and these therefore enjoy a certain degree of stability. Thus, the letter, as the smallest unit of language, was called an aksara, stable or durable, and language itself was associated with God and eternity by the ancient Indian philosophers. Now, the vague percepts, which are already tainted with the notion of stability, owing to the limitations of the sensory apparatus, become fully crystallized into concepts in the realm of ideation. Nouns, abstract nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs, in short, the whole repertoire of language, assumes a certain substantial character by virtue of its relative stability. It is probably this particular phenomenon that is hinted at by such oft-recurring phrases in the suttas as tamasa paramasa abhinivisa boharanti. Having seized tenaciously and adhering thereto, they declare such and such. And takka pariyahata, hammered out on the anvil of logic, 
cited in connection with dogmatic theories, which themselves are called dittijala, veritable networks of views. This vicious proliferating tendency of the worldling's consciousness weaves for him a labyrinthine network of concepts connecting the three periods of time through processes of recognition, retrospection, and speculation. The tangled maze with its apparent objectivity entices the worldling and ultimately obsesses and overwhelms him. The Buddha has compared the aggregate of consciousness to a conjurer's trick or an illusion, maya, and we may connect it with the above-mentioned image of the resurrected tiger. So this is a mouthful. <laughs> but Yanananda is giving an essential view here that just because you can say something, just because you can create a certain expression by using the rules of grammar and syntax doesn't mean that that statement has any reality if it's not in proper relation with its original subject. So the conversation becomes detached from the subject and in that way becomes apophatic, you see? So when this conversation evolves through many iterations, like a game of telephone, do you ever play that game at a party where you start out with a short phrase, one person repeats it to the next, and it goes around the circle, and by the time it comes back to the original, it's completely changed. Why? Because the original subject is not attached. The words themselves become the object. So this is apophysis and paraphraxis. In other words, we like to talk in a charming way in an artful way, an interesting way. So we come up with many expressions that use the uh, properties and specific laws of language to create like a word picture. But does that word picture refer to any actual reality? <laughs> in most cases, no. And that's why it becomes a uh, periphrastic uh, phrase. It doesn't really express the reality it's supposed to be talking about. Now, the Indian Vedic philosophy, which was the current world view at the time of the Buddha, is based on the assumption that consciousness is absolute and eternal, that there is such a thing as a soul, and that soul is ever existent and ever conscious. The Buddha rejected this uh, assumption. He instead used the assumption of Nibbana, which is beyond consciousness, beyond being and non-being, beyond time and space, beyond form and formless, beyond, in fact, everything. And it's indefinable. It cannot be nailed down. It can never be explained. It's an experience, not a term. So Nibbana is used as a placeholder for the unknown or the unknowable, the transcendent reality beyond all conditioned forms. So when this term, Nibbana, comes under the influence of Papancha, the first thing that happens is it gets defined according to grammatical laws and rules. And this was absolutely against the intention of the Buddha. The Buddha did not want to speak directly of Nibbana because we can't just grasp it. Huh? We can't discuss it directly. So anything we say about it is going to be papancha. It's going to be apophatic. It's going to be actually a lie. Because one cannot say that Nibbana is or is not or is and is not, or neither is nor is not. And those are the four uh, sections of the tetralemma, the quadrilemma. Uh, but we can't say any of those things about Nibbana, because Nibbana has nothing to do with being or non-being, is or is not. And this is the most fundamental grammatical construction of them all. It is or it is not. 
So if Nibbana cannot be defined in that sense, it really can't be defined in any sense. And this was the Buddha's great insight. So the Buddha installed Nibbana in the realm of the apophatic and tacitly talked around and about it. Or he assigns it to the class of periphrasis, periphraxis. And he talks about it in terms of epithets and euphemisms, expressions that somehow mirror it's certain of its qualities without discussing it or naming it directly. But this is the essence of the Buddha's style. This was the strategy that he used to avoid dragging the unknowable into the realm of knowledge, dragging the inexpressible into the world of expression. You see? And in that way, he kept it a dynamic living experience, something that cannot be known but only lived. This is the essence of Nibbana, and this is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Now, the lack of awareness of this periphrastic strategy of the Buddha has resulted in tremendous confusion and indeed the bafflement of most of the Buddhist community. So how did that happen? The commentaries try to go around the Buddha's strategy of apophysis in regard to Nibbana by defining Nibbana in terms of verbal roots. Okay, Buddha Ghosh, the principal uh, commentator on the Theravada Suttas, was a Brahmin before he became a Buddhist. He was from South India and he was trained up in this commentarial tradition on the Vedic scriptures that goes back to the original verb roots and redefines the terminology in any convenient manner for whatever point you're trying to make. Now, we feel this is dishonest and misleading, but Buddha Ghosh was an expert in this and he was very impressive in his scholarship. So he actually got a commission from the king to reinterpret all the old commentaries in terms of his definition of Nibbana. And then he burned the original manuscripts in Anuradhapura. The place is still there today. You can go and see where Buddha goes, burned all the ancient manuscripts so that only his commentaries would remain. Why? Because he could not tolerate the idea of an undefined term being the centerpiece of the Buddha's teaching. He just couldn't deal with it. So as a scholar, as a logician, he had to bring Nibbana into the realm of the concepts, into the realm of terminology, definitions, and logical relations. Now you know me, anybody who knows me. <laughs> knows that I'm a stickler for proper definitions of terms. And that also I use ontological analysis to define the relations between those terms in order to get at their full meaning and context. But here we have a phenomenon that goes beyond language, beyond ontology, beyond logic. This Nibbana, and, and to define it is to ruin the Buddhist strategy. As soon as we bring Nibbana into the realm of concept, number one, we limit it. We make it static instead of dynamic. And number two, we make it an object or a topic for development of papancha. And this is exactly what has happened in the Buddhist culture. Ever since the term Nibbana was defined, it has become the source of an unlimited papancha, papancha sanya sankha, going on and on and on, without any understanding or experience of the original term. Because as soon as one gets even a little taste of Nibbana, he realizes that this cannot be discussed in words. This cannot be expressed, it's ineffable. It cannot be articulated. No terminology, no system of knowledge 
can give even a hint of what Nibbana is. Nibbana is beyond everything. Gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, uh, bodhisvaha. The Buddha is gone, gone beyond, gone beyond, beyond. This is Nibbana. So how can you say what this is? How can you uh, apply terminology and logic and grammar to it? You see, without turning it into something that it is not. So in other words, since Buddha Ghosh, the conversation in Buddhism has become papancha. It has become a conversation that has lost its connection with the original object that no longer reveals the original meaning and intent of the suttas. And this is why very few people attain enlightenment these days. It has nothing to do with meditative techniques or any other reasons or moral degeneration or any of the other stuff that people blame it on. It has to do only with the fact that we no longer have the original uh, Nibbana, undefined term, Nibbana. Instead, we have defined it and brought it into the conversation as Papancha. So, because of that, now people have tremendous difficulty attaining enlightenment. The power of quantum computing is due to the fact that the state of the quantum wave function is undefined, isn't it? In quantum computing, the system can hold multiple values simultaneously. In fact, a fully realized quantum computer can hold all values for all the variables in a complex system simultaneously. And those values do not become fixed until the measurement is taken, until the system is read. And at that moment, then it begins to follow classical physics. Up until then, it's a quantum phenomenon. We celebrate and, and lionize and, and make into heroes people who go into the unknown and tame it and bring it back and make it something we can manipulate and control and possess and fight over and <laughs> you know, all the nonsense that goes on. So we like people who make the unknown into the known. Society rewards them in all kinds of ways. But wait a minute. A life with nothing unknown, huh? where everything is known, controlled, and predictable, is utterly boring, stifling, impossible. And, and this is the source of the, uh, the alienation, the, the anomie, uh, self-alienation even, that people feel about modern life. This is why there's an epidemic of suicide and nihilism in society today. Because the human race has become too successful. So successful we've taken all the adventure out of life, all the unpredictability, all the variation. Every day is just like every other day. Huh? We get up, set the thermostat to 70 degrees, go down, have breakfast, take a shower, whatever. Huh? Everything becomes routine. Dull, drab, horrible. So how do we preserve the sense of adventure, huh? the freshness, the taste huh? in life? It, there has to be some unknown. There has to be some uncontrolled thing that we are engaged with. Right Now, Buddha took this to the ultimate extreme with Nibbana. The Nibbana is impossible to understand, cannot be known. So how can we bring Nibbana under our control by trying to define it? We ruin it. And we take all the fun and adventure out of meditation, out of the Buddha's teaching, and make it into a dull religious ritual, repeating the same old words over and over again. And we don't understand any of them, actually. <laughs> 
this is going on. So, uh, what Buddha Ghosh did was actually turn the Buddha's teaching into a religion by introducing this idea of an eternal absolute. He made Nibbana, in other words, occupy the same position as God in the Vedas. And of course he's going to do that. That was his whole training. That was his whole background. His whole life had been lived in service of that idea. So of course when he got a hold of the Buddha's teaching, he said, oh yes, of course, we have to fix this. <laughs> there, I fixed it for you. Huh? But he didn't fix it, he broke it. And because he broke it, and because he created this whole enormous field of bogus conversations about the Buddha's teaching, he also broke the hearts of all the practitioners, the real followers of the Buddha, who know by their everyday experience the transcendental, indefinable, unknowable nature of Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta